Hello, how are you doing? I'm Craig Parkinson. You are listening to the Two Shot Podcast. Sit yourself down, pop the kettle on. We're going to have a nice old chat. Who's in with this week? I'm going to tell you right now. <laughs> believe it's episode 15 already can, can you i mean it's i think it's flying by myself great reaction to last week's episode joe sims uh i just thought you know with the state of the world we needed some positivity in our lives and i was right it made a massive impact for everybody and that's great massive thanks for joe as well uh for coming on this week a big massive thanks to the great, the lovely, the very chatty, which always helps on a podcast, Tamsin Althwaite. Um, myself and producer Griff were welcomed into her home in London. She brewed up some lovely tea. We sat down and had a great chat. It's a really, really lovely episode. We talk about all things, about her upbringing, school, support she had, um, all sorts. Look, it's a great... I'm not going to tell you too much about it you just dive in and listen but before you do you know that we started a patreon site now we've had a lot of new listeners a lot of new people join us on social media so if you didn't this is what happened myself and griff we do this for free we started it by ourselves and we're not begging we're not asking for any money but if you want to help us if you want to contribute if you like what you're hearing then that would be great Go to patreon.com forward slash two shot pod. All the info's there. A lovely cheeky little video. You can see what producer Griff looks like in the flesh. Calm down, ladies. Um, But just think, right, if everybody who threw us a quid, who downloaded our podcast, right, we would be able to make podcasts for quite some time. And we have had a lot of generous people who do that and we thank you so much because you know this started as a little idea in a pub in manchester and it's grown and grown and grown but that has been very generous backers who give more than a pound and when you give more than a pound you get extra special stuff one of that little bit of stuff one of that little bit of stuff i can't speak i'm so excited a little bit of that extra special stuff right is getting a shout out so listen up brendan mcavoy thank you so much for your generous donation Catherine britain you're there too you're on the list you're joining the family dancia king that's it dancia king you're on joyce bird thank you so much monica taggart too generous caitlin jackson Thank you. Sydney Rivere Maybury. I hope I'm saying that right. Sydney Rivera Maybury. Is that right, Sydney? I hope so. Not forgetting, last but not least, the very lovely Shane Atwall. You're very generous. Okay, that's the shout outs. You know to follow us on social media. We're on Twitter, we're on Facebook, we're on Instagram. We're at Two Shot Pod. I am on at Sea Parks 1976. All things there. You will find everything all up to date. Get all the information. Episode 15. This is it. It's Tamsin Althwaite. I really, really hope you enjoy it. And I shall see you back here afterwards for a little bit of special news. Enjoy. This is episode 15 of the Two Shot Podcast with Tamsin Althwaite. Because I, I knew we had two days of quite heavy sessions of podcasting. So to speak. heavy sessions. Who has a heavy Jesus. session? Not out going out drinking. Um, I tried to organise it um, geographically mm. instead of because I remember the first time. 
in the first block of podcast, we were bombing it about in London. It's quite hard with all if the gear. If you don't go to someone's house, where do you do it? <sighs> is it hard to find quiet places? Well, it is hard to find quiet places, but sometimes, you know, the, a little bit Ants. of ambience is nice in the background, but you don't want a load of people nattering. So if you're in a hotel lobby, lobby or, or something like that, it's no. like, oh my God, it's yeah. crazy. And of course, producer Griff is all about the sound. He gets very annoyed. Of course. Um, but no, we've found places like an office, but personally for me, and also um, for Griff as well, it is nice to move around because you're in a different environment. Yeah, so even yeah, if so you it are, sounds different, whatever. But even if you're doing a lot of talks and you're meeting a lot of people, they still stay fresh and yeah, alive yeah. instead of... One in, one out, and you're in, you're in a, in we were in a glass. Space. We had a glass booth once, and I did find that quite difficult. Yeah, and I and I was very worried about the quality of of the episodes, but turns out they were great. Yeah, so um, I've listened to all of them now. I think they're brilliant. Oh, I like, I'm so happy. Susan's was funny. I know, wasn't it brilliant? It's brilliant. I was quite. I mean, I was quite nervous about that. Were you? Oh, well, yeah, I think so. It's funny, you know. It was just nice to hear you both talking to each other. And no, there was part I, I of me that wanted not. you to just like grab her and kiss her in the middle of it and start there, getting her up against a wall. They're on the, podcast. the funny you should say that, um, <laughs> Tamsin Althwaite. There, we've just started a Patreon site, and our outtakes of that are, are if you donate a lot of money, uh, they're you not. Get to they're hear not. The outtakes. Please don't say that. They're not there. Um, if you don't already know, here we are. We've been invited in to the lovely home of the very lovely Tamsin Althwaite. Hello. Hello. <laughs> Thanks so much for coming on. I'm really, I'm, pl- I'm so pleased we finally got it together because we've been talking about this for a while. Yeah. And uh, the stars have aligned. It's all good. Yes. How the devil are you? I'm very well, thank you. It's very nice to see you. How are you? Uh, how are you juggling motherhood <laughs> and work? At the moment, quite well because I'm not doing ridiculous hours, so I'm quite, I'm loving dipping in and out. But there was a time when. You know, I would leave the house really early and get back really late, not see them awake. And I suppose that is what led me to a place where I was going, I don't want to do that for a while. So for me, the last couple of years have been shorter jobs and a lot more free time. Yeah. And that's mainly because of my fear of me walking in the door one day and then being teenagers and I can't find them and they're at some youth club or they don't do youth club now. Mm, They probably do somewhere. Discotheque. They were, then they're at something. <laughs> yeah, I know what you they're mean. They're basically, and you can't find them. Yeah. And everyone, the reason everyone says is, oh, make the most of it. It goes so quick. They grow up so quick. It's, it's for a reason. It's such a cliche, it but is it's a cliche so true, isn't it? it's true. Yeah. So I think the um, maternal side of me started to worry that I was going to miss their upbringing with TV hours. And so, yeah, I just made a few changes. And I've just had... To, for the last two years, I've had... The, apart from a six-week away when I was doing Stepping Out on a tour, I've basically been with them most of the time. A week in Toronto, two weeks here, but not, yeah. no massive chunks away. Yeah. So there's less juggling now. But who knows? It's only a phone call away where you go, could I make that work? <sighs> well, it's like, yeah. Someone do phones you, do... you and goes, can you... I mean, the things that I've not been able to do, five months in Toronto, you know, the th- th- three months in Dublin... I couldn't make those work. And also, do you want to make those and work? And actually, there's a side of me that goes, I'm not sure. It, it would. There was a time where it would have taken a lot to get me to leave them for a long amount yeah. of time. But now I've just had those two years. There's part of me thinking, oh, maybe, maybe it's time to tear myself away from them again. For a little bit anyway. Yeah, just for a short amount of time. What did, what did your parents do? So no one in my family had anything to do with this industry. So my dad, he worked for the Sunday Times in the print. He was head deputy of the Sunday Times print. I don't know what that means. I I do know what that means. He worked in the print room. And and then he was also a London cabbie. He's double jobbing? I think he double jobbed for a while. A lot of them did in the print. A lot of them were cab drivers and... Um, and that's what I remember early years, early days. And then my mum, she was a housewife, but then there was a time when she had a children's clothes shop in Brentwood in Essex. But apart from that, she mainly was, she looked after us. 
And then when she got a bit older, she's kind of retrained to do other things, mortgages and yeah. stuff. So then she became a mortgage advisor. Right. But that was as we got older. And when you say us, how many of you were in the... Me and two brothers. Really? One that's two years younger and one that's ten years younger. Right. And it, it was a very, not male household, but it, was, it wasn't like... My cousins were mainly boys, so it was... We spent a lot of time with them, and I think mainly th- there wasn't loads of pink and girly stuff around. I was always a bit of a tomboy. Yeah. It was quite a, a male orientated home. Would, would you say you're more of a, a, like a daddy's girl? Oh, I don't know. I, d- I think I was, no, not necessarily both a, a bit, really. Yeah. I mean, me and my dad have been close at different times. Me and my mum have been close at different times. You, But I've all, I always had a, I know I had a very loving, open, Childhood. Supp- support- supportive. Your supportive family. Oh, they were supportive of my job, absolutely. Yeah. But no one really knew anything about it. No one went into this kind of thing. And, you know, I don't think they thought it was a proper job. So, and they always had this thing that you don't, you don't praise your children too much because their head gets too big. So, <laughs> so their excuse for not kind of being really, I mean, they were supportive, but they weren't like overly like, oh, gushy. Yeah. So because they weren't overly gushy, I suppose, I didn't really, till I went to college, I don't think I really felt like, you know, what actors are like, and then you're all with like-minded people and everyone's really congratulatory about everything. Sometimes a bit too much. Sometimes too much. Maybe we pat (laughs) each other on the back too much. And I think I came from a very grounded background where you didn't really do that. Yeah. It was loving and it was very tactile, but not like... But you weren't wrapped up in cotton wool? No. No. Not at all. So whereabouts in Essex did you grow up? So I, I was born in Ilford in Essex, and I went to Urshaline Convent in Ilford for a while. And so was this, it was, was it, sorry, was this primary school or primary school? I was in uh, Gantz and no, I Barkingside in um, at St Augustine's at Catholic schools. My mum was Catholic, Italian right. Catholic, so for some reason we went to Catholic schools, which is something I think was a good thing now in some ways. But there's a lot of time spent on RE, isn't there? Yeah. If you're going to a, a, a church school or yeah. a specific religious schools. And, you know, I wanted to do other things, not talk about religion too much. So it was something that was in my childhood, but I kind of grew out of it. And I didn't follow it up, really. And, um, yeah, so we were, then we were in Loughton in Essex. We were in Gant, Gant's Hill and Clay Hall and then Loughton. This is, is all, sorry, I'm so ignorant. Is this all Primary Essex? school, yeah, all yeah. in Essex. But not like Deep Essex. You, Deep Essex, where you go like South End, Billericay, Romford, or Gidea Park, and that's kind of even further out. Right. Uh, ours was more just past East London. For instance, when I lived in Woodford, I was in E18. The postcode's E18, and I still my brother still lives there now. Right. So the first flat I ever bought was in that block in Woodford, which my brother is in now, and another friend's in another one, and basically. That was when I was 19 and it, it was £49,000. Wow. Them were the days. Weren't they? <laughs> we should have bought six. <laughs> so, yeah. So, so I still have connections out there. And, um, yeah, I, I suppose after I went to, I ended up in a comprehensive school because for me it was all about either sport or drama. Oh, you were very sporty? Yeah. At one time, you know, I was playing like... I don't badminton. know why I'm saying that like, oh, like it's a shock. Is it, is it really shocking? No, 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 because, no, you know, you, you always like, no, no, because you always like, you do, you love your gym and I know you love your keeping No, fit. I don't love gym. I hate the gym. Don't you? I hate I thought it. you really liked it. No, I'll do it. Ah, you'll I'll do, do it, it but, but very you like it or not. I like yoga and anything that's dance-based that feels a bit more like, like there's another, I don't, I'm not very good with the ego in the gym and yoga, hot yoga feels like there's no ego. Yeah. No one cares really what you look like although everyone looks great it's probably because they do hot yoga <laughs> yeah. were you were you a competitive uh, yes, sports person yes ridiculous well, yeah well what was your sport of choice it was well so I, I used to bounce I was like seeded in trampolining in Redbridge or Essex or something I can't even remember but I used to the other thing is I, I'm, I've realised I have got early onset of Alzheimer's so I might have to write get some things down sometimes as I'm doing because I've I've got a terrible memory. But I do know that I used to get to my convent school at eight in the morning with a little group of people who used to love trampolining. So we'd all be spotting for each other around the trampoline. And when I eventually... I mean, I'm talking early trampolining career. And 
And I remember finally getting a back summy, back somersault, and, and it finishing it. I know it, what a back it, summy is, sorry, you don't have to... Just, uh, <laughs> <stand it. laughs> and, uh, and I remember doing it and, and thinking, oh my gosh. And then we all got picked for the competition. I don't know why, but there were trampolining competitions and my school was really sporty. I'm still surprised there was trampolining in school. I'm trying to still get my head I know. I, I, I mean, I can't imagine it happening now. This was senior... No, it wasn't. It was junior school going into senior school. So, so I remember we... I, I was in a trampolining competition and I think I came second. And through that competition, you are seeded. So, as a result of that, I was number two in Essex. My or, God. Or number two in Redbridge? Can't remember. But, so then I used to get into the school early. And I'm sure that I had a key to the gym so that I could go in there early and bounce. And there was nothing like that. So then as a result of loving that, I think then we were in, you know, I was captain of my netball team. We used to play tennis for my school. And that it was quite difficult to fit it all in, but I, bet. I think it was always sport or drama or dance or something. You know, it was never really anything academic. Right. And... But did, I, I didn't have enough time to fit all that in. So, you know, maths. God. Did you enjoy the academia or did, was it something that um, you found you had a block on? Or? No, I didn't have a block on it because my teachers at the time would tell my mum, oh, you know, she's really quite bright, but she just needs to work a bit harder or she needs to not be so distracted with her other things mm. or, you know, take it a bit more seriously. But yeah. I didn't take it very seriously. But... What I did need, which I loved, was when I got to my convent school, I arrived there after being at school in Barkinside in, in Ilford in Essex, the, my um, St. Augustine's, which was great, but we had a f I had a few problems with friends. I don't even know if you could call it bullying. It was probably being left out a lot. Yeah. And I, so I wasn't particularly happy. And my mum took me out of there and she wasn't particularly happy either. And, and then we went for this written exam at Ursuline Convent and I got in and I went there. And we got an assisted place and because of my dad's situation, which was that he was not probably as wealthy as the other, other people. I remember it was £127 a term. I remember seeing the cheque that he used to pay, which was wow. absolutely incredible. Yeah. You know, for all of the facilities that the school offered in those days. It was, I mean, it was late 70s, early 80s, early 80s. Right. And um, and I remember getting into that school and thinking, I needed the structure. You know, as a child that was brought up in a house that was really beautifully, like uh, the door was always open, there were always people around my house. You know, they weren't particularly academic, but they were very loving people. And I think when I went to my school... There was a nun at the front of the class. We all had a desk each. You had to use a fountain pen. You had indoor shoes and outdoor shoes. No way. Summer hats and winter hats. Pleated skirts that my mum could never get the pleats ironed <laughs> back in because they all, I was the one that had the ridiculous tutu looking one. And I think I needed the structure. And I needed someone to tell me, you have to do this homework and you have to actually use your fountain pen with a proper ink nib. I mean, it was like going backwards, I yeah. suppose. But the, the the discipline was amazing. And I think I just welcomed it. And then having the discipline of you know, the independence of like getting on the bus and going, I've got netball practice straight after school. You know, I see my nine-year-old sometimes having it now with, I've got dance and then I've got the... And there's a sense of the independence that you, yeah. you suddenly have. I think I was very independent from a young age, definitely. And it gave me a proper thrill. So then after being in that school for about four or five years, we moved out of that area and my local comprehensive was also a Catholic school called Trinity. And I remember I went into that in year two of senior school. I don't know what they call it now, it's different. but And that took me back, because it was all girls, my convent. Right. So that took me back into a mixed comprehensive. And I think when I went into my mixed comprehensive is when I found... At that age, the distractions were Amdram, anything outside that was exhilarating. Was drama boys? On, was anything. drama on the curriculum though? Then yes, it was, and I, I did it at Trinity. So I was the last year of O levels and CSEs. Yeah. So I took drama as one of my sites. But what I didn't understand is you can never take music and drama. In, they were always in the same block. You had to choose between music and drama. 
And I wanted to do both, but you couldn't. So Were you quite musical? Didn't play, I mean, went through trying to learn to play loads yeah. of things, but... I wanted to, it to be a subject. I wanted to be able to be given the chance to, to extend what I was had learned, like on the guitar or on the clarinet. You know, it was early doors. But yeah. I suppose I chucked lots of things at the wall and what stuck is what took me into my senior school. But there were loads of things that you, I kind of started for five minutes. But drama, I knew I wouldn't be able to do it with music. So I took drama. And I was the last year of CSE, and, and I remember working, that was the main thing I worked really hard in, the, the written work as well as all the impro. And, I mean, it was quite thorough. And I got a CSE grade one, which they class as an O-level. But I think that's the only thing I really put the time and effort into. And was there a time, you, at that time, did you feel... Because what I'm hearing, and I don't know if this is right, you... Are you very confident at school? Mm. Because you seem to throw yourself into absolutely everything. I, yeah, I think I probably was quite confident. Although, you know, there were obviously times during teens where you lose that confidence or you're trying to find yourself. Of course, because, you know, when you're trying to grow up, you, yeah. try, you desperately want to grow up. Yeah. I think um, there were times when I was younger where my dad said he'd be watching the football uh, with all of his mates. And I would want to show him the dance I'd just learned in front of the FA Cup final <laughs> with Arsenal playing, which is like his worst nightmare. So I know for a fact that I was probably annoying when I was young, like little, yeah. like confident and annoying. That's for sure. Um, but it was probably because I was trying to get the approval of my parents who had this thing that you must never praise them because they'll get a big head. <laughs> so I was like, what about this? What about this? <laughs> no, um, I, yeah, I suppose I was quite confident. And then I think in my secondary school, I found Amdrams. So this is extracurricular, out of school time, amateur dramatics, do you mean? Yeah. Yeah. And leading up to that, all I'd done was, I think I went to Sylvia Young's on a Monday night drama in Gants Hill for a term. Did it, um, why just a term? I don't know. It might have been a bit longer, but it... Was there something not yeah. connecting with you? Or? No, I, I, I really enjoyed it, but it was like, my t it was very difficult. I mean, my mum would be, run me around everywhere in her car, and it was me that had Monday night this, Tuesday night that. Yeah. Wednesday night. Sometimes I think, I don't know how she did it. She just, you know... I'm exhausted just hearing about it, to I be know. honest. My God. It's, so I suppose there were just tons of things that I always wanted to do. And then, of course, you hit a stage where you go, I don't want to do any of it. I'm 13, 14. Did, did that hit for you? Did that happen? It did a bit. I gave up ballet. I gave it any, every, every form of dance. I didn't do drama anymore. And it was more about... I don't know if it was the, sh the peer pressure of feeling any kind of shame. I don't think it was. I think it was more about kind of boys and going in a different direction. Yeah. Wanting to... Not wanting to spend all my time in a group of people reading aloud. I wanted to go and sit around my mates' houses. So it was about adolescence, I think. Yeah. So even everything, even the drama took a backseat. Well, I then. tell you, all, all of it just got kind of pushed to the curb, really, kicked to the curb, apart from me and my best mate at the time, we, in the stage newspaper, that at the age of like 12, 11 or 12, we used to flick through and talk about, <laughs> this is what we wanted to do. <laughs> And oh, so was it was already there at that, that time that you yeah, kind of... Yeah, I think it was. But do you think you were deadly serious you know about what? it? It wasn't actually. It wasn't the stage newspaper. The stage newspaper was later. It was the Ilford Recorder. The Ilford Recorder. Yeah. And there was a, it was like an advert in there for open auditions for a, a new, like an Amdram, an amateur theatre production company that was going to be in like late... We had to go to the audition in Leytonstone. It said the ages were 13 to 25 or 26... So I don't know why that age group. And I was 12. Right. <clears throat> and I think most things had been kind of forgotten. I'd left most of it. Even like tennis, everything. Well, I was playing netball at school and that was it in my new school. But sport, like dance and drama, I think was just gone. And I went to this audition and I was 12 years old with my mate. And it was a group of people that had all known each other before, and mainly Jewish people that were all from my area. Yeah. And we lived in a very Jewish area when we were young. My dad was the only non-Jewish cab driver in my street. So all my friends were Jewish. 
And I didn't have a boyfriend that wasn't Jewish until I was in my 20s because they were the only boys I knew. And this theatre company was mainly made up of a group of people who were... They, they went to a Jewish youth club, basically, which I wasn't allowed to go to because I was Catholic. Right. So I used to wait outside <laughs> for them to come out. And we'd, I, I went to these, um, this audition and they asked me what my age was and I said 13 and I was and I was only 12. And we auditioned and then... Do you remember what you auditioned got, I, I don't remember anything about Did the they make audition. you sing? All I remember is sitting in the bathroom upstairs, listening to people warming up, singing, oh. and thinking, I can't sing like that, I can't <laughs> sing like that, this is horrific. Anyway, me and my friend got in, and the first musical that we did, that and that, the feeling of going to a group that was like, became your new family. And I don't know if you ever did Amdrams, but it was like, rehearse for six months for four shows. So you'd rehearse for six to seven, eight months, then we put on a show at the Intimate Theatre in Palmer's Green. Was it called the Intimate Theatre? Still there, I think. Is it still, is yeah. it still called the Intimate Theatre? I think so. I love that. We did one at the Shaw Theatre, which was in, King's, was in King's Cross. Is that now the Peacock? I don't know. Anyway, so so basically, we I'm upstairs in the bathroom. I can hear it all going on. Eventually, I got a message saying that I'd been accepted. And then every Thursday night, I'd go to this place in Leytonstone with my mate and became part of this massive group that were already a family yeah. that kind of took me in as part of their family. It was all run by this woman called Phyllis and it was called Stage Struck Youth Theatre Company. And that's where I feel like I grew up in that group of people. It's where my first proper boyfriend happened. Right, of course. It's where... You know, we all would go around to each other's... I got invited to people's Friday night dinners, which was a, a big deal. And probably because there's a, a mix of, you know, 13-year-olds that just, you know, the start yeah. in puberty. And also you're mixing with uh, probably a, a, a 20-odd-year-old and a 19-year-old. Oh, yeah. My first boyfriend, I was 16 and he was 20-something. Bit, uh, not, not we sure. didn't do anything. I'm not crazy. sure about that though. Do you we know didn't I mean? do anything. I'm we not just, saying. I'm just we went it, to the cinema know. and held hands and things. Uh, yeah. Weird. He was twenty. Okay. Um. Um, <laughs> and, and actually, he ended up buying my mum and dad's house, but quite not that long ago. I think that's probably another Weird. podcast. Move He's on. basically stalking <laughs> me. Um, In answer to your question, yeah, I did do a little bit of amateur dramatics, and uh, yeah, I got asked to leave. Did you? Yeah. Why? Again, it's probably best for another podcast. Carry on. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, so it's, ba- you know, learning to be part of a musical, whether you're working towards something and there's an end show, it probably gave me a really big buzz and then I was like, oh, this is amazing. This and that is what family feel do. as well. You're all like-minded people. Yeah. You're all there. And I don't, I'm not sure everyone wanted to do it for a living. Oh, really? Still, you were on the fence? <clears throat> no, not me. I'm not sure that everyone else really wanted to. I mean, if oh, I could right. have done this for the rest of my life, I was right. like, absolutely. But these pe- all people had proper jobs. Yeah. And, you know, and I did, at times, quite early on, I had like a Saturday job in Barrett's shoe shop. I used to work for my dad. He had a, a video round called Rentertainment, where he used to rent out videos. And I used Rentertainment? To, Rentertainment. Oh, and I used to go God. with him. I used to work in, Love you know. That. I would do anything for a bit of cash. I was quite, well, not anything, but I was quite um, productive, shall we say? Right. And, yeah, it pro- that probably came from my dad of, like, needing to, you know, work quite early. So he instilled a good sort of work ethic Yeah, in yeah, you. and my mum. So basically, and it being, you know, it, it was quite a financial thing. You know, you're, at some stage you're going to have to stand on your own two feet, which was always at the back of my head. I don't think they ever said that to me, but I think somewhere I was, I got so independent that I was like, I will earn my own money. I will do this. Yeah. But the thing about stage struck was they were, the majority of people were Jewish and my mum was Italian. So it was all about like dinner, dinners were all about sitting down with a big group of people and eating. And so it was almost like home from home, this group of people. Yeah. And, but in a way, you know, even now, you know, a great professional theatre company, uh, and I very rarely do loads of theatre, but when I do, it's with a group of people and we all sit round together and we all yeah, eat, eat together, together and we all talk and you just become 
that family and it's, yeah. it's very quick. Only theatre does that, I think. Well, to uh, that extent. You, it happens as well in TV or film or whatever. But yeah, I think... but it's so much easier to walk away when you're doing TV and film. Because it it's very, you can do your scene, that's and great, and it's done. But when you're on stage <clears> with like 20 to 30 people and everyone's singing and the harmonies are incredible and then you're dancing as well and then there's people watching you. I mean, for me, the buzz yeah. of singing and dancing on stage with a group of people... It wasn't like you had to be the lead. I just wanted to sit to hear it and yeah, yeah, yeah. be part of it. And there is, I, I still stand by there is no better feeling as a performer for me than the feeling of being on stage and being in a musical because it's, it's the swelling of the harmonies when you're, I mean, it's making the hairs oh, go Oh, you still now. love it. Yeah. yeah, I do. And being, when you were doing the stage truck stuff, was that when it really started? Yes. The, the buzz really Yeah, that's started. when I knew the buzz was something I couldn't really not follow up because it was too good. Yeah. Um, and how long did you stay there for? Because you, obviously you started just when I was bel- 12. below the, the, the age. Yes. So we did Oklahoma first. Then we did Showboat. Then we did Grease, which I played Sandy in. So and how old were you when got... you played Sandy? Please don't say 14. 14. Were you 14? How old was you, Danny Zuko? 43? He was 25. <laughs> 25! <laughs> yeah, something like that. Oh, we've got our stage, stage stuck on the podcast. There's all sorts of wrong things going oh, on I know. there. <laughs> and, then the, and then I think the next thing was Fiddler on the Roof and I had to come out of it early because I went to drama school. I went to performing arts college. Right, but so this was what? You were what? How old are we 16. now? 16. Then. Yeah. So I, w- between the time of joining Stagestruck, 12 and 16, Phyllis, who also ran Stagestruck, had a dance and drama school for kids right in my area. Right. And I started kind of teaching the little ones. Really? So on a Saturday all day, I had a Saturday job, which was teaching very young kids tap, ballet, modern, like the beginnings, you know. Right, so the dance had come back in, having, yeah. having been pushed away, yeah. that had come back in. And a bit of drama as well. And it was mainly, I mean, it wasn't like at one of those schools where they do exams and grades and it was, it was just a really lovely little school and I really enjoyed it and she paid me well and I had a nice time. So when Fiddler on the Roof had to pull out of it, um, it was because I was auditioning for schools and I just didn't have the time to carry on rehearsing for... Are we talking about drama schools now? Yeah. Yeah. So, so because I loved musicals as well, I hadn't really discovered that I wanted to act more. I was like, I just... I mean, really, my ambition was to be in Cats, the musical. And also, let's bear in mind, you're 16 years old. Yeah. So what do you know? You, you don't well, really you, know anything. You, Again, the arrogance of youth comes up in nearly every every one of these bloody podcasts. I wish I had my confidence like then to just go bang. Oh, don't we now? All? Yeah. But um, but yeah. So if my ambition was to be in Cats. I saw it nine times. Nine times. And the thing about Cats was, in the interval in the olden days, <laughs> Brian Blessed used to sit on the stage through the interval. And children used to go up on stage and queue up to sit on his lap, which would never be allowed. No way. So Brian Blessed would be sat there, and in the interval, I would be the first get up to the front. I really want to sit on his lap. He's old Deuteronomy. And there's all Brian Blessed dressed as a big cat, staying on stage. Yeah, through the interval. And Do you know what I'm thinking now? Bless the bugger, he didn't have a break. I know, me too. (laughs) That's all I'm thinking. No, because he had a break through the show quite a lot. Oh, did he? Well, you know it intimately. Yeah, so basically, I, uh, I just, that was my ambition. And the weird thing is, is later on in life, after auditioning for it three times, I got it, but I was too busy and I couldn't do it. No way. So that was my ambition. And then I kind of surpassed it somehow and couldn't do it. Were you gutted? No, or, or, or... it was a part of me that was like, I'm saying no to my ambition. And there's something that makes me feel really good about it. Probably because... It would have absolutely killed me. Yeah. Every dancer right. I know that went into Cats, when you'd see them on a Sunday, which was their only day off, Broken. they looked ill. Right. Green, skinny, <laughs> you know, you can't eat enough food, injuries. Oh. So as much as I desperately wanted to do it, I'm not sure my body would have been able to take it. Anyway. So you're 16, so you're yeah. auditioning. I was auditioning for drama schools, but I didn't think I was going to get into any. This is... 
So I really was convinced I wouldn't get into anything. When I say drama schools, I'm not talking about the big, heavy, your... Where were, your, where were your auditions then? It wasn't at RADA and Centre and Lambda. It was like Doreen Bird, Lane Theatre Arts, London Studio Centre, Arts Educational, Italia Conti. The ones that would take... Uh, People from younger. Pe- people at 16 yeah. instead of You couldn't the go to those, of, the other ones yeah, until you were 18. 18. Yeah. And I also, you know, I wanted to go... There was a point when I was younger, once I'd found Andrams, that I really wanted to go to a a full-time school like Sylvia Young's or something like that because I thought that would be... Imagine that. Especially the kids from Fame was on telly. Imagine being able to go to school every day. Right, so with these ones, am I right in saying that you're there Monday to Friday? Yeah. And so you mix in... Uh, no, at these ones it... from 16, it's just performing arts. Oh, but is it? Before 16, I'd wanted to go to a full-time school and my mum had never let me because she said, quite rightly, I would thank her now, she said, no, I want you to continue with your studies. If you really want to do it, when you leave school and you've done your O-levels, anyone that's younger than 853 O-levels used to be the exams we used to do before GCSEs. Yes. And I was the last year of it. Let me make that clear. That's quite clear. We can do... Uh... <laughs> so basically, my mum had said, no, you can't. So I think that was quite a good decision. And then I waited till I was 16 and then I was kind of chomping at the bit to yeah. try and get somewhere where I could do that every day. I mean, who, what, if you, if you like, if you got such a buzz from it, who yeah. wouldn't want to do it all day? Well, exactly. But this was really about musicals, I suppose, at the time. So I was looking for a school that kind of did everything, but I didn't expect anyone to kind of actually say yes. But they did, didn't they? And so I, I myself, with my own money, paid for seven audition fees for seven different schools because I was worried that I wouldn't get into any. Can you remember, and you probably you might not be able to, can you remember how much it yeah. was per audition? I think it was £50 per audition. £50 even then? Yeah. My God. Yeah. And you paid out of your own pocket for seven? Yeah. <sighs> but I remember... Because I just thought it was... I saw the statistics... You know, of, of people getting in, how yeah. many people audition for how many places, and I just thought it was pretty unrealistic. Well, There's not a lot. I mean, what? How many places? Twenty? Not many. I can't. I don't even know. Yeah. And then, of course, my parents. The the ones that I wanted to go to were up about between two and three thousand pound a term. And I, I suppose I didn't really want my parents to be under that kind of pressure because there was also two boys after me. And what are they going to? do that so there were scholarships you could audition for and then in those days you could audition for a grant and Essex County Council gave out a boy and a girl grant and would that grant cover fees and were you still living at home at this point I was still living at home right so it would just be a grant that would pay your fees fees plus because I would have probably moved to wherever the school was they would pay you living expenses. Oh, they would pay you living expenses. We're as talking well. about in the golden days of grants. My God, you know, yeah. I wonder how kids do it now. But... Oh no! And so I remember because it was the performing arts one. It wasn't like the drama. It was. It was. I think it might be musical theatre. So I had to do an audition, like a, a drama piece, a song, and then I had to do a dance class, and I had to dance in a class with like thirty people, and we were all auditioning for this one thing. And then I remember getting the letter through and saying I got it. Wow. So it was like, what? They're going to pay for... And then you you had to decide where you wanted to go. So I auditioned for seven schools. I didn't get into one of them. And the one that I chose to go to was because... This is how basic it was. I walked into the cafe downstairs. Everyone's sitting, eating. There's music playing loudly. It was like the kids from fame. (laughs) At that time, when I was 16 years old, I was probably a little bit obs- obsessed because that was the only programme. Now, when you turn it on, there's so many about Yeah, but probably then you were looking at that going, look, look at those at guys, that. that's exactly what I want to be exactly. doing. That's where I want to go to school. I mean, it, it sounds like such a cliche and it sounds like something like, you know, the kids from fame, it's just all so naff. Yeah, but it, but, was, it, but it wasn't the, for you but, at the time. Not at that time. So, what was it, 1987? And 
I remember going down into that cafe and everyone was like, there was music playing and people were eating their food while dancing. And then I looked over and there was a telephone in the corner. And Louis Spence, do you know who I mean? No. Louis Spence is a... Now is a big reality star, but he was in a program called Pineapple and he's been a dancer for a very long time. And he was in, I think he was in the first year there and he was shouldering his leg. What does shouldering your leg mean? It means holding your leg up here by your ear. Oh my God, I can't believe you've just done that. That is incredible. Griff, I wish you could have (laughs) caught that as a Patreon (laughs) extra video. What? Oh, wow. (laughs) There it goes again. This, <laughs> this, this is anyway. Please is this carry horrific on. for you? It's incredible. Find me some real actors. <laughs> it's incredible stuff. So, uh, so Louis Spence was shouldering his leg whilst eating a sandwich, and I said, "I want to come here." <laughs> <laughs> That's how basic it was. I was like, "This looks like," and it was called London Studio Centre. It was on York Way in right. King's Cross, and it was the most expensive school at the time. But I had this full grant. So I got into... I suppose if you didn't go to somewhere, they were going to take that grant away from you. Oh, you have to choose it. Yeah. Yeah. And and also it meant that I I could stay at home if I wanted, but I could also get a flat nearer King's Cross. And Mm. I was in Essex, so it was probably an hour and a bit on the tube. And I did it for the first year. And to tell you what, in the first year, I really didn't knuckle down. And I was kind of reprimanded. I was late every day. And it was probably because... I was coming from home. My mum was always late. It's a running joke in our family. So I was... But the one thing that comes up in these podcasts nearly every time is punctuality. I know. And be on time. I know. Know your lines. The main thing is be on time and know your lines. Yeah. But by the way, I now have a phobia about lateness. Oh, Properly. You talk to producer Griff about my lateness thing. He's doing something oh, very rude. I'm obsessed rude. with it. <laughs> yeah. I'm obsessed with it. So I'm never late now. No. But it came from being left outside in my little ballet tutu with no coat going, why is you not here? And my mum will always, you know, she made a joke of it. And she'd be like, oh, I was waiting for the washing machine, man. <laughs> uh, but it's, it's a running gag in our family that you have to tell my mum an hour, that it's an hour later. I mean, an hour earlier yeah. so that she'll get there. <clears throat> anyway, so I suppose I still hadn't, my, my discipline wasn't really up to scratch of my first year, which is when I should have really knuckled down. But my f- first year at London Studio Centre was like, I was trying to get to ballet in the morning. I didn't really know if I wanted to do ballet. You could choose your own timetable. You had to do ballet every morning if you wanted to dance. Right. If you went onto the drama course, you had to do voice every morning. And what I realised in the first year is I was never going to be a dancer. I was never going to be a ballerina. I was too tall, too big, you know, and I'm not good enough. So doing ballet every morning was actually the thing that was stopping me from getting there on time because I couldn't bear the idea of it. And my ballet teacher at the time, one of them, Michael Moore, would probably say, oh, but Tamsin, you, you looked like you loved it or you, you were good or whatever. And no, I wasn't. I would probably put on a face about it, but I really didn't love it. So in the first year, I was just a bit slack. Sec- when the second year came along, they, they pulled me up on it and said, you know, because I had the, the grant from Essex County Council. Which uh, could be taken away at any point. Of course it could. Yeah. If, they, if they reported to them, listen, she's... Late three times a week. Yeah. That would easily have been taken Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I think being spoken to and being reprimanded m- told me that, you know, although this is the kids from fame, it's not about the canteen. You've got to get into the classes. Yeah, of course. I loved all the camaraderie. I thought I was still at stage struck probably. Right. Let's all go out to eat, you know. Yeah. Being a social butterfly but not really knuckling down. So did you pull your socks up after that? So I that? pulled my socks up and in the second year I moved on to the drama course which meant that I didn't have to do ballet every morning. I did voice every morning, and then you did a lot more drama and much less dance. I didn't need to be doing contemporary every day and mathematics, jazz, and, you know... If you, it was a bit like jack of all trades and master of nothing. So what do you do? Do you carry on being all right at everything, or do you focus on something else? Of course. I just think I focused on drama. For yeah. Me. Are you bored? No. Why is it? I'm so, really... So, do you know when you go, oh, God, how long have we been talking about myself? I know that's the point. It's a podcast, Tamsin. We can edit this bit out. I know. Please carry on. So you focused on the drama. So then I focused on the drama, and that took me to a place where I think, I thought, this is what I want to do. 
And I got such such a lot out of my course from there. And was this a three-year course? Yeah. So you, did you leave there when you were 18? 19. 19. 16 to 19. Right. So the second year was, was much better. And I was then I was in cast in the plays. And then I got a different buzz from it. Because I was still doing my dancing. But now I was in the plays. Not just the musicals. And you did know? you feel you were learning a completely yeah, different discipline? Yeah, very different. And then in the third year, they made me head girl. Because I brushed up so much wow. that I, I transformed from year one to year three and then you're outside taking student fees from people and giving out like newsletters and things which was really not me but so I kind of what I've learned from that is and from the the um convent school is I need discipline I need people to tell me you have to be there at that time otherwise you're out yeah you have to write with this you have to wear those shoes in this class because otherwise I'll just turn into some hippie barefoot wanderer yeah and so that I suppose that's that was the thing and then I left there and I'd auditioned for a couple of things before I left I had a great drama teacher at school called uh, Ian Dewar who really championed me so you know when you get someone behind you and it gives you an extra. And he was, apart from the fact that he told me to change my name because no one was ever going to be successful, called Tamsin Althwaite. <laughs> and he did say to me once, you should change your name to, and it should be TT, Tamsin Tart. No, 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 no. no in a drama no, no. class. And I said, I, I, I'm not going to change it to Tart. And uh, I think he was probably joking, but... I ended up feeling like the only reason I'd ever change my name is if someone else in equity had it. Yeah. Otherwise, I, I didn't see the point. So to make something catchy, and uh, They'll so remember I kept. You. But you know. You and did you get? Did was it uh, when you graduated? Did you do some sort of you know the agent showcase type? Of yeah. Thing? So and you, you got an agent from that. Uh, yeah, well, I already, kind of, but I already had an agent because I was doing extra bits of work, but it was mainly dance work because these are the days where you needed 34 weeks to get your equity card. Right. 34 weeks of work. Yeah. And I danced in a dance group in all sorts of places. We would go, like, in in clubs in the West End, and then you'd be at a bar mitzvah at the weekend. So and it was a four-girl dance troupe. So I needed to get contracts to get my equity card. So that's how I got my card. And that was done during my last year at college. So I'll be doing it at night, you know. And I remember my dad coming to pick me up at like one in the morning from some club. And he didn't like it, obviously. <laughs> and I was like, Daddy, I've got to get my equity card. I remember at one point he said, can't we just buy you one? <laughs> I was like, no, Dad, you can't. You have to do 34 weeks of this. So I suppose I just wasn't really scared of the hard work. I quite liked it. And then I left college and I'd already auditioned. So Agent-wise, we did a showcase on the last day and I already had a, a couple, because in those days you could have a couple of agents running at the same time. Really? Yeah. Wow. And so I was working, I was getting jobs and a lot of it was like... And this was 19, wasn't it? You were 19. Yeah, yeah. I was getting jobs like commercial dance work. So like I was in U2 pop video, I was in pop videos and I was in... I was doing fashion shows as a dancer, stuff like that. So really, dance was the way in to get money, to be able to live. Dance was the way in to get an equity card. Dance was the way into drama school as well. Dance was yeah. the way into the drama school yeah. to then change on the course. So it did serve me quite well, I think. Were but... you feeling equipped when you graduated? Did you feel ready? Oh, gosh. I don't think you ever learn in your three-year course. You don't feel ready. You learn on the job yeah. a lot more, I think. Yeah. I mean, the thing that I learned was a work ethic. Um, and, gosh, I mean, we never learned about cameras. We never learned any TV technique. So everything w when we were training was about being on stage. So I suppose there is a part of me that when I go and do something in theatre and I'm on stage, it sounds really cliche and cheesy and wanky. But it's all right, you can it's, swear, it's fine. It feels like kind of going home because that's what I learned. Yeah. So being on stage feels like this is where the, the roots of your foundation of your training is, not in front of a camera. Now, of course, on this podcast, we, we don't generally uh, discuss jobs or really dissect them. But I do want to talk about, because theatre was such a massive, massive thing for you, mm. and then all of a sudden you popped 
into telly. Mm. How was that? How was that transition for you? So I'd done eight years of musical theatre in the West End. Right. So lots of shows, and then I went to Scarborough to work with Alan Aitborn at the Stephen Joseph Theatre, doing their playing our song. And he was just he championed me. And he was a lovely. Is that a musical? Yeah. Right. So it, it's Janie D and three girls play her alter egos. So I was one of the girls, and. While I was up there, he asked me to audition for Absent Friends, which was his next play that he was directing. And I was like, I haven't done a play professionally. I've only done musicals. Some of them have been parts in musicals, but I've never done a play. And I got the part of Evelyn, and he's, that was my first play, being directed by Alan Aitborn in his right. theatre, doing his work. Yeah. Which was one of those moments where I couldn't quite believe it. You know, he was... He was just very generous and I felt like he took a risk with me because but he saw something as I don't know. I I I used to sit in rehearsals. He he remembers this. That I used to sit in rehearsals and even if I wasn't needed I'd always watch. Because, I wouldn't go out the room. But how fantastic that you're in a uh, a new environment. Yeah. You just needed to you need to eat, you need to learn. Yeah. Yeah, and that's the way, isn't it? To yeah. just listen and watch and lap I lapped it up just sat on the floor watching how he directed his own stuff, watching how they took direction, these people that have been doing it for years. And it still happens now though, doesn't it, when you work with people and you watch oh, them. Yeah. Sometimes I, I I might have done a scene opposite someone and I've had to come out myself going, I'm just watching I'm just you watching act going, acts. Oh my god, no, how do you brilliant. do that? You're brilliant. I know, yeah. I know. So I, I think that's why you learn so much of your, your trade, don't you? On the job. From other actors yeah. and directors and people you're working with. Um, and I suppose uh, once I did Absent Friends, it was like, oh my gosh, I've just done a professional play. Not at college. Yeah. And then, then I did one more job for Alan. So it was over a two-year period I was working with him mainly. Uh, called Baby on Board, which was a musical with Dennis King who wrote it. And Dennis King and I became really good friends. And then we started up a little cabaret... And it was while I was doing Baby On Board that I was up in Scarborough and I came back to London to audition for EastEnders. And that was a workshop East End, um, audition and that was about 20 girls and 20 young boys and they were looking for two characters. And, yeah, and I remember it was like an all-day workshop. Yeah. Which suited me. Yeah. I don't want to go in with a piece of paper when I haven't done anything like that. And you're probably kind of used to that workshop environment it's quite anyway. quite theatrical, yeah, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, uh, yeah, and I, I remember in the days of having a pager. Right. Before mobile phones, I had a pager and my agent at the time said, um, can you call me? And I was at Tottenham Court Road Station coming out and it went beep, beep. And I remember going, oh, I've got to, I'll have to call him now and finding some change because there was a row of those phone boxes at Tottenham Court Road yeah. that now no one's ever seen, no. you know, since... And I remember <laughs> standing there and phoning me. He said, um, um, Matthew Robinson and Julia Crampsey are going to call you now from EastEnders. And I said, right, OK. And uh, I called, he, I don't know how we did it at the phone box, but they called me. And Matthew Robinson said to me, Tamsin, are you ready for your life to change? And I remember thinking... It's only a three-month contract. <laughs> I mean, you know, it's, don't have a kitten about it. It's literally, a, in my head, it was just another acting job. Yeah. And it was three months, and he said, are you ready for your life to change? And I was like, well, yeah, I think so. In what way? And they hadn't offered it to me. He just wanted to talk to me. Yeah. Which they'd never do now. And he said, oh, um, we'd like to offer you the part of Melanie, and... You start on Monday with a photo call and then we'll go straight in. I was like, okay. And then Julia Crampsy got on the phone, the cast director, and went, are you happy? And I was like, yeah. And I remember coming out and my best mate, Smudge, Jason Alper, lived in Islington and I was always at his house in between auditions. And and I always got on the bus from town. I think I'd been at an audition in the morning. And I got, instead of getting on the bus, I remember I hailed a taxi as if like, no, I'm going to treat myself. <laughs> I'm going to get in a taxi to Islington. 
And yeah, that was that. And then, but I really did always think th- it's a three month contract with a three month option. And I never saw anything past that. I don't think I ever went, oh, there's my ambition. A p- once cats had been and gone, yeah, which it had, yeah, there was no plan. It wasn't like I ever went, oh, now I'm going to crack America. Now I want to do this kind of drama. And now I, it, it was something that I was open to any of it, but I never had a plan. So a three month contract ended up being what? Three and a half years. Three and a half years. Yeah. Which was, that's where I learned about how to work with multicam. And hard graft as I mean, well. That, four, that is tough. Four cameras on you, hitting a mark, which I'd never done. Yeah. I mean, I, th- I think I did an episode of Men Behaving Badly and an episode of The Bill before, before that, but that was it. And four cameras, and sometimes, if you're in lots of storylines, carrying around 16 scripts at once, if you had a double bank and an extra and a special and this, and all six weeks ahead. And so if there was ever a training for television... That was it. Yeah, which it was for you, obviously, because oh you, gosh. you know, you did your three years at Lane Theatre Arts, London Studio Centre, London Center. Studio Centre. Sorry, it's all right. and then, uh, then you did your three and a half years on EastEnders. Yeah. So and so, I suppose I remember when I got the job, my mum was not that. She was like, "Oh no, everyone talks like that." I remember, and I hadn't been allowed to watch Grange Hill when I was young because they didn't like the way that all the children spoke to the teachers. Really? Yeah. And most of Grange Hill kind of ended up in EastEnders. Yeah, of course. So in my mum's head, although they were originally from the East End of London, there was something probably about the roughness of it that was that they were worried about. I don't know. But anyway, I was like, Mum, but we talk like that anyway. It doesn't matter. <laughs> That's how we talk. It's all right. Own it. How did you deal with such, like... Immediate success. So, I mean, with EastEnders, because it was a very different kind of... Uh, yeah. I think because the discipline of musical theatre is so intense... Yeah. ...that being able to take that through meant that... And also, I was 28 when I got it. So if, I, if I'd have got it when I was 18 or 19 or early 20s, I'd have been a mess. Yeah. You know, but I suppose not being... You know, I'm still young, but not being still making tons of mistakes in public. You know, you've got load millions of people reading at the time. You know, all the tabloids, the press was quite mental. But um, I do remember just loving my job, opening a script and going, "What am I doing next?" Yeah. You know, and that lasted throughout the whole of it. Did it for the full three? Really, years. pretty much. And it was only when, when the BBC did Red Cap, which was kind of for me, that I thought about leaving. I probably would have stayed for another year or so. Right. And then Martin Kemp said he was leaving, and I thought, well, that's kind of the end of an era. It's time to go. And they'd let me go off to do a programme about swimming with dolphins, the BBC. They'd let me go off to film the pilot of Red Cap. So really, I suppose, it felt like it was coming to a natural end at that time. And... Do you feel, obviously, I don't know if this is a bit of a stupid question, as a woman in this industry, and you were 28 at the time in EastEnders, playing this this great character, mm. it's quite feisty, mm. she? Well, she started off like a girl next door with, like, little twists in her hair and a pink cardigan, and then by the end she'd been through it all. Through all the mills, with the proper EastEnders yeah, mill. Yeah, of course. But do you feel now, of a woman... In, in your in your forties, do you feel that things have changed for you as an actor? Oh yes. In in do you, in in what kind of way? Well, for instance, now work is it's, it's just different. It's not playing. You know, you just you, you evolve into a completely different character. So naturally, that the work that comes in now is not like leads at the forefront of things. Mm. You know, and I'm quite happy with that. I don't like having it all on my shoulders. So I quite like an ensemble piece. Yeah. Probably that also comes from theatre, loving a group. Um, and now I, I think, well, hand in hand with the fact that the parts are not coming thick and fast. I mean, if, you, if I think about when I left EastEnders for the years after that, I just couldn't fit the work into the time. No, you're never off the telly. 
which I suppose you're, you're only going to have so many years being able to do that. Yeah. Or people are only going to want to see you for so much time because, you know, that's enough. Of course. It's a little bit overkill. And I, I suppose I had a few lovely jobs for the few years after that. And when people were coming with scripts, there was a time I remember where there was a pile of scripts and I didn't have time to read them. When I think about, you know, if you could space that that work that happened in the four years out throughout your life and just like, just <laughs> even it out. Do you know what? I'll do that, but I'm just going to do it in 10 years and I'll do that in five. Yeah. Yeah, of course it would be ideal. Yeah. But that, I suppose we are taught as actors that you have to make hay while the sun shines. Of course. And that you never say no, that you always try and fit everything in. And I think I tried really hard because I was so... Like amazed that I was still making a living out of something I loved doing, that I just carried on. Yeah. And I, it wasn't like, oh, but which script is better? It was just like, yeah, and I love that. Per Not every decision was like ridiculously thought through. Um, and I think I probably burnt myself out a bit at one stage. Uh, physically or emotionally connected Both. to the job? Both. Did you fall out of love with it at yeah. any point? Yeah, yeah. Definitely. And how did that manifest itself? Um, I suppose I got a bit blasé about it and you're not taking it as seriously. So you started to care less? Care less is absolutely it. And were yeah. you careless as well? Yeah, probably. I mean, you, there's only so many years you can keep going at that pace. Of course. And I think children stop, slowed it down for me. Because you have to. Of course you do. And... Because it ceases to become about you anymore. E exactly. Yeah. And I think that when I did the first series of The Fixer for ITV with Peter Mullen and Andy Buchan and Joe... Not Joe. So I did... Right, we can add, yeah, right. What's his name? He'll edit that. What's his name, that little one that used to be in Shameless that messed it all up for himself? Jodie. Jodie Latham. Thanks. Um, Definitely edit that down. <laughs> messed it all up. Mark Thanks. it. Um, yeah, so when I did the first series of The Fixer with Andy Buck and Peter Mullen and Jodie Latham, so it was the four of us, and I remember the scripts being brilliant, the director was brilliant, and this was a job that I really wanted to do. And it didn't feel like everything was on my shoulders and I'd be doing everything. You know, it was a team. Yeah. And when I just started, I just found out I was pregnant with Flo. And I went to the female producer and spoke to her about it and they were lovely. And then it went again to series two. And when I started series two, Flo was three months old. And that was being out the house for four, four to five months, morning till night, you know. And so I suppose as much as I loved doing that job, that was a bit of a turning point of, is this unrealistic? Can I carry on at the pace that I was carrying on at yeah. whilst breastfeeding? Yeah. Does that work? Can I juggle that? And, you know, I've managed to, but I think you rethink things then. Do you feel your priorities changed or the business sort of changed towards you or do you think it's probably a bit of both? It's definitely a bit of both. Yeah. My priorities have definitely changed. And I think that you're looked at differently when you have children. I mean, things definitely slowed down. And I was I was still working, I was having a great time. And then I did it I went the, to Manchester for six months when Flo was nearly two and that was the last time I really spent any chunk of time and even with like my nanny or her dad bringing her down it still was really tricky yeah um and that was probably the last that was the last time and then the next time I did like a big long chunk of a series was um new tricks and that was filming in London so you could pop home every and, night. Yeah, yeah, and that that suited me. But in between that, there was a, a year on Sweet Charity, the musical. And that time was when Flo was teething. She'd be up every night and I was doing eight shows a week. And that was... Knackering. And I was like, maybe you can't do this anymore, yeah. you know? Always testing yourself and going, I, I reckon I can do this. But actually realising, 
Is it worth it? Is anyone happy in this? So um, the slowing down has been an, a, a quite a gradual thing, but it definitely, everything has, the, my perspective and my priorities on everything have changed. And now I'm okay about saying no. Yeah. In fact, it, it's quite empowering sometimes. It certainly is. And whatever happens in your day and whatever happens with work and now if I audition for things and don't get them, which is quite often, I come home and there's these two beautiful faces looking at me and I'm home. I'm not away. Yeah. And I'm glad that I realised that before it was too late because loads of people say, oh, I'm just gutted that I spent so much time away. And I feel like I've managed to kind of curb my workaholic ways, I suppose. But do you still have love and passion for... Oh, yeah. But you have to... You have to step away from it sometimes to be able to find it again, I think. Yeah. Because sometimes one job can turn things sour. I mean, it hasn't happened very often. I've, no, I but those, always... bad, those bad experiences do yeah, t- tend do. to taint a lot of things. They really do. Um, I mean, I still don't have, like, burning ambition. My thing is that I really would like to just continue making a living from doing something I love doing. Yeah. I'm happy to move sideways. That You know, this career ladder that seems to be an imaginary thing it doesn't really exist (laughs) you know and everyone's trying to climb up it and there have been times in my life where I felt like I've been at the top of it and then it's like it's it's no better no it's still all about what's happening for you yeah it's you know so you know I always remember after doing Out of Control with Dominic Savage and it was all completely improvised and it was winning awards at all the festivals and stuff and, and I thought if I don't work again I'm happy. This is done I'm it. done. Yeah. I've done the the probably the best piece of work in my career, but every piece of work is beneficial for a different reason. Of course. And some jobs you do because you want to work with certain people. Some jobs I've done because you can't turn the money down. Some jo- you know, and the the reality is now my life with two girls is not all script led like it used to be. No. I'd love it to be. But well, exactly. I'd but love it to be. What but we were saying can't. before, priorities change, and yeah. we all need to pay bills and pay our mortgage. Of course, mortgage. we do. And have you ever thought about stopping it all? Have there have been got... times, yeah, definitely. I, you know, I love doing interiors and and getting properties and doing them up. And there's lots of other. I, I like doing upholstery. I like rubbing down chests of drawers and painting them and finding funny knobs. Yeah. <laughs> But you know, it's basically, uh, I like art. I like lots of different things. I'm not one of those people that, that is defined by my work. I don't feel defined by my work. I'd be quite happy. If it all stopped? If it all stopped, what what would I do? No. Would you, would you go, do you know what? Yeah, I did all right. Yeah, Definitely. Definitely. But then there would be a part of me that after a while would go, oh, or you'd see, if I go to the theatre and I see something, that makes me go, oh, ah, the I really little want to do another play. Back. Or I'd love to work here. Like when I worked at the Royal Court, you know, if I go to the Royal Court and see anything, it still gives me these feelings of, God, I've worked here. I do feel like I, I um, made the most out of, in my up till now career, yeah. made the most out of my, what talent I had. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. So I don't feel like I'm... I know an awful lot of people that are like, why aren't I getting those jobs? Of course. You, you can't be that because... I've never your... had that. Yeah. I've always just thought, oh, look at you. I think that's a really healthy way, a really I, healthy attitude. I always think that if you don't know how lucky you are, you will never be happy. And on that lovely note, Tamsin Althway, thank you so much. Thank you, Craig. I can talk, can I? You can talk. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. <laughs> How good was that? I mean, it was so lovely to sit down and have a brew and spend some time with Tamsin one-on-one. She's uh, she's a real breath of fresh air. She's really lovely. I mean, we've gone from episode 14, mass positivity, episode 15, bright, sunny, cheerful positivity. And it's great. And she's lovely. And I can't thank her enough for coming on. Uh, I think she enjoyed it. She described herself this week 
on social media as sounding like a cheerleader who'd had loads of candy floss. And do you know what? There's nothing wrong with that. It was great. Tamsin, thank you so much for coming on. It was brilliant. Uh, yeah, that was it. I hope you enjoyed it. What have I got to tell you? We are hitting the road next week. We are... Oh, we're in London next week. We've got a very busy two days of recordings with some extra special people. Not that people before haven't been special, they have. But these are a couple of people whose names have been thrown about from day one since we started the podcast. From you lot out there, uh, I think you're going to be happy. Uh, I'm very excited. Uh, and, uh, yeah, well, I can't say it anymore. You will just have to wait and see. Remember, follow us on Twitter, on Instagram, on Facebook. It's at Two Shot Pod. I've been Craig Parkinson. He's been producer Griff. And this has been the Two Shot Podcast. Thanks for downloading. I'll see you again next week. See ya. Two Shot Podcast is presented by me, Craig Parkinson, recorded and produced by Thomas Griffin for Splicing Block. Our music, our brilliant music, is courtesy of Then Thickens. Cheers. <laughs>